Good morning, good morning, everyone, colleagues of the media. I think that today, as well as, uh, as it's being a special feature, the feature of recovery, I think it's great that we have all been able to cross the control. So thank you very much for coming. And with no further ado, I shall leave you with our executive uh, vice president and CEO, who is going to be telling you about innovations and the approach for this 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you once again. Another year. Thank you to the media for being here present. Truly, it's such a pleasure because many fairs have been cancelled, but FITUR has happened every year. Last year it took place in May. This year, I think it has been very important to have it when we have to have it, which is in January. And I think that all of us together have to learn to live with the pandemic being cautious, but uh, up to a point trying to lead a normal life. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you in our, to be here for being here in our press conference. Thank you to an excellent politician and even best friend, the president of the Tenerife uh, Cabildo, the government of Tenerife and the Canaries. Thank you for being here. He's always proven to be a great friend of us. And it's clear that the incredible development of Melia in Tenerife, especially uh, in your area, was because of you being the mayor in those times and the mayor of the municipality. So it's the great story of success of the company in Spain. So thank you for coming and legitimating our project that I'm going to be talking about soon. Just let me talk briefly about what last year meant and what the future will bring. So as to the balance, I'm not going to give you all that many details. I guess you all know as well as I do. Well, from March 2020, when the pandemic suddenly exploded in Europe, there was a reduction of more than 200,000 billion euro. And in the worst moment of lockdown, we had more than 750,000 of the tourist sector in uh, regulation because there were no jobs to be had and no jobs to be put into action. It was really the most disruptive moment for tourism ever in the world. The expectations for this year, 2022, we believe the first quarter is still going to be difficult. However, the rhythm of bookings for the Caribbean, especially on behalf of the uh, market in North America, is very positive, better than expected. We think as well that the second and third quarters of 2022, as this sixth wave of the pandemic eventually is mitigated and disappears, will make for an optimistic scenario. The volume of bookings, either for Easter and also summer this year, compared to the same dates in last year, January last year for uh, Easter and summer, well, we have 11% more bookings. So it seems then that people really want to travel and in the world of holidays, we believe that we're going to all benefit and we expect during this year, during 2022, to go back to the levels of jobs and income that we had in 2019 for our vacation ho hotels. We think, we are sure that Melia will be one of the most benefited companies because of the um, great portion of hotels. 61% of our portfolio is vacation hotels. I would say that the resilience of the tourist sector um, is something we have to talk about. What are the keys for resilience? Well, it's been spectacular, hasn't it? And those destinations that have done things better are those that were able to sell safety, especially health safety. And those destinations that knew how to adapt, that knew how to be flexible as to cancellation policies of the bookings have proven to be the most efficient. So those have had the best management. They've also had human talent because human talent has played a relevant role. So my thanks to the commitment and sacrifice of the 41,000 workers of the Milia family. And it has been proven that those destinations in which uh, that public-private partnership uh, was working have known how to manage the corona pandemic problem better, and they are leaving the crisis behind better too. 
So it's what we always said, the public-private partnership was important. And if it was important in the past, it is essential now and in the future, especially with coronavirus challenges. So now the challenge really, the winners are in those that are here in the post-pandemic proximity and short radios. In fact, in many south destinations and also the east of the Iberian Peninsula, we have profitabilities, incomes and profits that are slightly over levels of 2019. So we clearly see that people want to travel. There's a dependence on the national domestic market and those uh, reservations and bookings are taking place. And people are reacting well, as I say, especially in the domestic market. Well, companies that during the pandemic took care of their stakeholders, those that took care of their employees and their customers and their partners and the hotel owners, those that took care of their suppliers, I'm sure are the companies that are the winners of this post-pandemic time that we're living in, and definitely companies with a digital and distribution ability before COVID will be strong. And uh, well, we're talking about 38% of our income generated by all our own Melia.com digital channel, right? There have been moments in which during the pandemic, Melia.com was more than 80% and last year the accumulated figures were really extremely high we know that there's going to be a twofold operation meaning companies and destinations in which it's holidays and urban leisure that are at the center will recover faster than those that depend on business travelers and uh, the mice sector travelers, definitely. So they will recover faster. But then what has been done regarding opportunities in post COVID times? Well, work on reinforcing and strengthening what makes us unique. That starts by digitalization, going on with talent management. We have always said that our main assets are the people that are the Melia family. Also going in even deeper into sustainability, strengthen our accounts, financial resilience, then make sure we work on brands that get to the heart and to the soul of consumers, experiences with the soul, and then as well growth that we lived not only during the second half of last year, but we believe that future trends mean that growth is going to be good. So those pre-COVID growth rates will be overtaken. Definitely, we will improve. I'm going to go into each one in detail, but as I was saying, Melia.com has been our great tool to counterbalance the devastating effects of COVID. As I was saying last year, more than 70% of sales of the company come from digital channels, either ours or those that, uh, online travel agencies. Melia.com, as I said, uh, got to more than 55% of total sales last year. And the mid-time goal is that at least 50% of total sales. When I say 50%, I mean the income of pre-COVID was close on to 2 billion euros. So then that means 1 billion euro will happen through our Melia.com distribution platform. As I was saying, there's something else that has helped us a lot. And it's the fact of us having our own digital channels because we have reduced intermediation, the mediation costs, things that were done by third parties are now channeled to our own resources. In March, we're going to be launching a new generation of our website, melia.com, and we are working very much on the app of Melia so that the stay of our customers with us is as digital as possible without losing a human touch which defines the sector and our company so much. We have worked as well on the digitization of all the processes, administrative processes uh, with and for our customers. We want them to have contactless experiences. There will be hardly any friction at all, hardly any contact, but there will be a human touch. For that last year, we invested more than 20 million euro in technology for this to be possible. We are also working intensively and have been during the pandemic. We had many of our employees, uh, well, those that were not working 
in hotels were being trained, especially in digital skills that we believe are going to be so important and so necessary in post-COVID times. As to human capital, human resources, we have worked harder than ever. We are convinced about the fact, as I said, that the people are our main asset. We have been giving more training courses than ever, and especially training courses to make sure that the skills required by the new environment, digital skills, those skills that have to do with sustainability, with safety, are given so that when we once again start in a certain normalcy, which I hope will come soon, our staff will have gained all that knowledge. We have created super teams, uniting what is good and the different abilities of the different persons in every team. We don't want to leave anyone behind. We are inclusive. People, sorry, yes, people usually see digitation as a threat and we want to change that. We consider anything that is digital a great opportunity. And we believe indeed there is going to be an increasing fight to gain talent. And there we have been working a lot. First of all, preserving our internal talent. And second, having and establishing alliances with schools to make sure that regarding the growth that will come in the future will mean that we can have the best possible talent always taking into account diversity and harmonization. I am very proud to say that for the third consecutive year, we have been selected by Standard & Poor's Sustainability Index as the most sustainable company in tourism in the world, either in Spain, Europe, or within the whole world. Uh, and as to worldwide, we are silver. It was Hilton that got the first place, but I can guarantee that we will go again for gold as we had in the two last years. We'll go back to gold medal as the most sustainable company in terms of tourism in the world. Here you have some indicators explaining this. It's either in green energy, where for seven consecutive years, we have 100% of hotels in Spain, France, Italy, Germany, and the UK using green energy. We want to get to more destinations, but in some places, it's still not possible to contract green as a, a circular economy issue that has to be taken into account, especially for the islands, such as the Balearic Islands and the Canary Islands, because they have problems of space and water. Then we have uh, zero kilometers saving in investments, 51% savings. We really have worked intensively on anything that has to do with sustainability. But really, this truly makes us different from most of our competitors. As to financial resilience, well, 2021 started not too well, as was the case for most players in the sector. And really, it's interesting how we were able to multiply times two, the income of the first quarter into the second, and we were able to multiply times two in the third quarter compared to what came in in the second. So we have improved 161% and the EBITDA has increased 329%, obviously 2020 is a pretty poor year, but what's most important, what is most relevant is that since May the 15th, our company generated both EBITDA and positive cash flow month after month. So we are still far from the levels of 2019, but there is a clear path to recovery. So what are we doing about brands? Well, for me, this is going to be one of the important news. We see that customers tend to go for unique experiences. They tend to go to more premium hotels and lifestyle hotels. So we believe that as a vacation company, we have to go more for this segment. We have to make sure we create experiences for our customers. And what we see is that the tariff of 2021 for premium hotels has managed to be 4% over that that was obtained in 2019. So what we see here is that customers, when they are given unique experiences, are ready to pay for them. Here, what I want to present to you, and I'm, I really feel proud about it, is that we have a series of hotels that are really their singularity deserve us creating a new brand in our portfolio, in our company's portfolio, and it's Melia collection, the Melia collection, luxury five-star hotels. I insist 
singular, each one of them. We have many examples. Here you see our hotel, the Serengeti Lodge in Africa. It's a five star and only has 55 rooms. So it is a unique experience for customers. And here we have another example, the Villa Marquis Hotel, one of our six hotels in Paris. And here we see what I wanted to introduce to you in Spain, the new member of this club of the Melia Collection family, the Hacienda del Conde Hotel. Thank you, Ricardo Reyero, he's here, the owner of the property. Thank you for trusting our company and thank you to our partners for having been able to work on such a magical project and make it part of our new brand, the Melia Collection. My thanks to the president of the Cabildo Canary government. Thank you for having allowed us to work in such a magical island as Tenerife. And this shows as well what defines a whole canary village, both in architecture and the different elements, the use as well of kilometer zero, yes, zero mile, as regards supply that has to do with beverage and food. And it is surrounded by an incredible singular golf court, golf uh, field that has been designed by Severiano Ballesteros. We continue with the collection brand and we have our boutique, our jewel in London. It's the London Kensington Hotel. Then we have the Desert Palm Hotel, 50 odd rooms surrounded by four polo fields in the midst of the desert and less than 20 minutes away from the center of Dubai. Something else I wanted to tell you is that uh, in our belief and our work for brands, we have been very, very brave and we have taken to Europe for the first time a brand that up till now we had uh, strongly in the Caribbean. And in this case, we're taking the brand to two hotels, one in Lanzarote and the other in Gran Canaria in the Canary Islands. We're talking in this case of the Paradisus Salinas. It's a five star luxury hotel. And we do believe that we can take all the magic we have acquired for so many years uh, managing luxury, all-inclusive hotels. We can take this to such a unique, marvelous destination as Lanzarote. Here we have some photographs. We are investing over 15 million euro to, I insist, uh, take all this magic, all this experience and this service that defines us in the Paradisus brand that was uh, something that happened in the Caribbean. We're working on what was the Melia Tamarindus, and we're going to change it to a Paradisus Gran Canaria, in this case, with an investment over 50 million euro to be able to reposition this hotel and have it in the Paradisus brand. Let me tell you also that uh, in this uh, work on Paradisus, in the coming months, we are going to be opening, I don't think it will be more than two or three months, our most recent jewel of the crown, the Paradisus in Playa Mujeres, this in Mexico. It's a unique location. And at the back, there's a marina of the very first category. I also want to announce something that we are very proud of, which is uh, our Gran Melia brand that is uh, premiering in Menorca. We have the old San Tomas Hotel. We are now investing more than 30 million euro in order to take this to five-star luxury to the island. It will be opening in the third quarter this year, and this is a total reformation. Here you see the old hotel in the photograph. It was the Beach House Menorca, and the renters of this investment uh, were there. What's most important is that this is going to be the first carbon neutral hotel in the Balearic Islands. We want it to be a reference as to sustainability and uh, we are convinced that uh, a place like uh, Menorca deserves it, but not only that, it's going to give us really great satisfactions and, a, and a, an incredibly good result. Let me tell you as well about some openings that will be happening this year in 2022 in China. As you know, we have 12 hotels already. We're going to be opening in the coming months the Gran Melia Zhengzhou. When I say the coming months, I want to be more accurate, but of course, as you may understand, depending on the incidents of the pandemic, 
there might be some delays of the more singular works that are taking place. But in any case, we are so proud of uh, working in China in unique destinations with products that I really can say are singular. We have the Grand Meliad Cordusio. This is in Cordusio Square. It's less than 100 meters away from the Duomo. Here you see it in Milano. And this is going to be our jewel of the crown in Milano. What's most important is that in a place uh, like Milano, I mean, there's great competition. So next year we will be having four hotels and there are four brands. We have a Grand Melia. Right now we have a Melia, a Me, and an Insight. So that means we will be covering the whole span in such a gorgeous place as Milano with products that I insist uh, are not only singular, but also prestigious. Here we see some examples of the hotel. Here you see the proximity to the Duomo, to the Cathedral of Milano. We have, uh, we opened less than one month ago or a month and a half to Mi Barcelona, the first hotel, the first five-star hotel that has been, it, that is uh, newly built. As you know, in the City Council of Barcelona, they decided to stop for more than six years the building of hotels. And this then is the first of its kind. It got all the licenses, all the permits, and it is a new, newly built hotel. And what you see behind is the Plaza Catalonia, which is the center of Barcelona city. And it is really a singular five-star hotel. I'm fully convinced it is going to give us great satisfaction and will help us to position us back again in such a great destination as Barcelona within the radar of the tourism sector. So here we see uh, that this year we've not stopped at all. And when I say that, I mean that we have been able to open 13 new hotels, all of them during the second semester. But what's most important is that we have signed 21 new projects to be implemented in the coming months. The difference compared to the growth of brands in the past is that many of those were newly built hotels. And in this case, most of these 21 new hotels are existing hotels. So hotels that will start contributing to the EBITDA and the fees of our company right from the first day, right from the first moment. Here we see, I insist, the most recent openings, the 13 hotels I mentioned, and uh, in places where we do believe that we have an incredible competitive advantage. It's all the European Mediterranean Basin, Caribbean, and the Asian Southeast. Examples are Melia Chungking. This is a vacation hotel in China. We have the Melia Phuket a great hotel in Thailand, in the Phuket Island. We have the openings that we have been working on in Europe, Newcastle, Liverpool, secondary towns in the UK, but interesting for the British market, it's very important to be there because it's a, a relevant market for the company. After Spain and the US, we have the UK. We have opened as well our second hotel in Luxembourg, the inside. Other examples of recent openings, Marrakesh in Morocco, the Sol Oasis, or another hotel that's been so satisfying. This happened last summer, the Playa Esperanza, which is a resort uh, uh, right there on the beach in Alcudia in Mallorca. Other examples of recent brands, the Palacio Aviles, the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Rhodes, and the Halel Benidorm apartments here. Let me share with you the current pipeline. All the hotels for which we have signed contracts that we will be adding to our list. We're talking all in all of 52 hotels in 18 countries. In in more of, all of them we are established already and it sums up to 12,000 rooms. What's interesting is that out of 52 hotels, 77% have our management, 17% uh, franchise, and 6% only are rents. And as you see, practically two thirds of the hotels out of these 52 are devoted to the world of holidays, and only 38% are urban. And then something that's very interesting is once again, that two thirds of these are happening in the premium upscale segment. That means four stars, um, five stars and 35% are mid-scale, so it means 
four star. So once again, we see that our intention is to strengthen our presence in the Caribbean, Europe, Mediterranean Basin, Middle East, and Asian Southeast, which has the concentration of our efforts regarding expansion. Next openings, as I was saying this year as well, as the Playa Mujeres Paradisus Hotel, we're going to be opening the Gran Melia Sengzu, and we will at least open 11 hotels in Caribbean, Mediterranean, and Asia. Here you have an, an image, an example of a hotel I will open in the month of March, the Chiang Mai Melia in Thailand, a magical place. I'm fully convinced it will be a reference in Chiang Mai as to luxury and holiday hotel work. Here you see the development uh, examples in the Asian Southeast. We have the Gran Melia Natang, as you know, there we in Vietnam, we are the very first hotel company as Melia. And Vietnam is one of the countries that will be concentrating quite a lot of the future growth regarding holiday destinations in the region. We see other examples of hotels that we're going to be opening during this year, the Melia Trinidad Peninsula in Cuba. This is our work for a magical place such as Trinidad. And furthermore, Trinidad is an example. It means uh, setting value not only on sun and beaches that are marvelous, but also on a colonial, colonial urban location that is beautiful and, and deserves being visited. We have other ventures. You can see beach in Crete. And here, this is all. But as I said to you, well, indeed, we are facing uh, 2022 full of hope and eagerness, also being very cautious because I personally didn't expect the huge impact of this sixth wave of the pandemic. It entailed, of course, the Omicron variant, but we are fully convinced about the fact that what is most important and it's the desire to travel, this is still there in our customers, definitely. And amongst us all, we have to make sure we learn to live with the virus, I insist, being very cautious and, well, as far as we can, adopting a normal life that I hope throughout this year will be more and more visible and more evident. My thanks to you all for being here. And please, any doubt, any question, feel free. Now's the moment. I don't know if Maria wants to organize this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Please go ahead. If you have a microphone, it's important you use it. Good morning. Thank you. Well, obviously, this is uh, quite an international affair, but from the point of view of my sector, of the companies, what's the impact and how do you see recovery? Well, I think the difference regarding the beginning of the pandemic is that all events were cancelled. However, since the month of June last year, many events have been contracted. And when this Omicron variant came along, instead of cancellations, what we have seen is delays, adjournments. And this, I believe, is a positive message. So many of these events will, I'm sure, take place during the second semester this year. However, I have to say that these will be more hybrid events where there will be a combination of face-to-face -face and online meetings. And this is a reality that we have to gradually get used to. It is true, we've gone from huge events of 1,000 or 1,500 people to 10 events of 200 people. I'd say this is even better because sometimes very large events are difficult and they create certain disparities in hotels where you have to guarantee that you can fit uh, people, yes, I mean, 1,500 person, and this generates uh, those uh, edges of pre and post um, persons arriving. So these events, as I say, will be smaller, maintaining safety measures. But yesterday, for example, we were uh, we concentrated in a huge theater, more than 1,000 persons in the same place in Fitur. So, I mean, I insist it's important. We have to respect safety measures for health, but very slowly we have to get accustomed to this new reality. Having said this, I know that 2023 will be a very important year in events, and this will also be the case of the second semester in 2022, but let's get used to this new, more hybrid type of events with face-to-face -face and also remote contact through digital technologies. More questions? Yes, hello, good morning. My question 
is when do you think that we will get to the full recovery of, pre of sales previous to the pandemic? When will Melia have the same level? I believe this will happen in 2024, definitely. There is an important reference to take into account, which is the tariff and the vacation. So we see that in 2022, as regards holidays worldwide, we're going to be getting to figures of 2019. For urban segments, especially because of this bad first semester where people are still teleworking, most companies are doing so, and many events are being delayed, they're being postponed, incentive traveling and so on, will take a year longer. So I'd say 2023 as to urban hotels. So, I mean, we, we will go back to those 2019. I think at the end of 2023, beginning 20, of 2024, the estimation is uh, very cautious, of course, if there is no alarm, we will get to income levels before COVID. More questions? Good morning. Yes, I have two questions. First of all, when the Palacio Gisora was designed, it was designed as a paradisus. And then you didn't think it was good to go into Europe with this brand because it was not the time. But now I see you go in with Salinas and Tamarindos. In the near future, will the Palacio Gisora be a paradisus? I wouldn't dare say no. But it depends, doesn't it? The difference is that the this one from the beginning uh, had a very good position. In fact, two years were difficult because of the position, that quality situation. But this is a hotel that has um, goodwill that's impressive with more than 35 percent uh, customers repeating the destination. So we don't think it's a good idea to change the brand because the position is very good as it is in the future. Well, maybe. But I have to say that both Salinas and what was that Tamarindos, yes, we think it's been a great idea to take it to the Paradisos brand. Yes, and second question that's very different. During the pandemic, I heard complaints from you and other people in the sector of lack of support from the administration of certain regional governments. I remember an interview of yours where you talked about the full support you were getting, for example, in the Dominican Republic and not here. So have you signed any commitment with Balearic authorities or other examples in Spain of the commitment of the public powers for recovery? What is clear is that in this pandemic, and I said it before, obviously the public and private collaboration was important before, but nowadays it is essential in those destinations in which that public private partnership has worked. They've not only managed the pandemic better, but they have actually ended up better. I can give you examples. The Canaries and Balearic Islands are good examples of public private partnership and collaboration. Here we see the presence of the Tenerife regional government, and that shows the interest to help tourism. So then I'll only say good things. But yes, in Spain as a whole, there have been, well, other places in which sometimes the percentage of tourism over the domestic GDP were less than what we have in Spain. And in fact, they have been very active. These are destinations that have, uh, well, reacted faster. The great example, yes, is the Dominican Republic, both the president of the country and the tourism minister in the Dominican Republic have uh, talked with all actors, and I don't mean only hotels, I mean tour operators, airlines, and they have had even monthly or even weekly meetings. So there's been incredible follow-up. A lot of actions have been undertaken. There have been a lot of suggestions as well coming from the private groups. We were the first to suggest that PCR testing should be free for people arriving at the airport or at the hotel. It was the first country to actually implement this measure. We suggested also a special medical insurance regarding COVID for tourists in the destination. And that was, it meant, you know, work kicked together. And all this means that the Dominican Republic, since the month of September last year, has month after month obtained figures better than those in 2019, better than pre-COVID results. If we could extrapolate that uh, public and private collaboration model to other places, it would be great. 
However, I insist in Spain, some regions, yes, have reacted, but nationally, that would be very good. More questions? Hello, good morning. First of all, could you please clarify some figures I could not write down properly? This year, you have opened 13 hotels, and in your project for next year, how many hotels? At least 11. Let's see, let me clarify. One thing is opening, and the other is brand. So last year, we opened 13 hotels, and we signed 21 new management contracts. For this year, openings at least will be 11. Yes, and then something else I wanted to ask you. People are talking a lot now about uh, restructuring of jobs in the sector. It's been talked about. I know that you as a president will support this, but then maybe in recent days, the Minister of Tourism in Spain might have said something to you about any governmental intentions. What we say is that there is a unique opportunity now to have a quantum leap. It's the next generation funds, yes, the European funds. We know that it is the greatest amount of money that the tourism sector has ever had. That's 3.4 billion euro. But if we see the contribution of tourism pre-COVID, more than 13% of the GDP in Spain. So if it's 13%, of the 140,000 million, yes, uh, both in uh, borrowing and lending and direct investment, then we believe at least we should get 17,000 million euro compared to the fraction of what it means more than what has been assigned. Having said this, I'll tell you that we think that the next generation funds, as the name indicates, means that they have to go along with strategic transformative projects that help towards the tourism sector in Spain. And many undoubtedly will be invested in digitation, sustainability, and that we share. However, in the first uh, assignation of 120 million euro, these have been really scattered investments. And in many cases, they won't really change things at all. There's no strategic transformation in that first investment. So once again, we have said to the government and to the Minister of Tourism that we can help them, that the public-private collaboration is the best way to go, and we can help them better invest and better distribute those funds, and we know where they could go that would make a, a better difference, so to speak. And we think that many pioneering destinations on the coastline, for example, especially as to the first mm, millions invested, have not been benefited regarding those uh, million, at least as regards percentages, yes, uh, because they are tourism factories, so to speak. And pre-COVID, they generated 70% of the tourism income of Spain. Thank you. There's one last question, I believe. Yes, one last question. It has to do with measures to obtain liquidity to have cash flow in these difficult times. In the recent past, you sold hotels. So this year, what are you going to do for cash flow? What uh, divestments uh, do you want to carry out? What hotels are you going to be selling or what will you do? What's most positive is that, uh, well, regarding the terrible tsunami of the COVID in tourism, I mean, in 2020, the pandemic meant a loss of 90% income for many companies. And in 2021, it's a loss of 50%. So our company from May the 15th has continued generating positive EBITDA and positive cash flow. So we do have an inflection point in that we are not consuming cash flow any longer. We have expectations of recovery of the positive cash flow in daily operations. And that really is, is incredibly positive. But not only this, as we saw last year, we do consider the possible sale of some assets. Last year, it was six hotels in Spain. Uh, in a vehicle in which Melia had a majority participation with a management contract of 25 years. So we believe that throughout the first six months this year, 2022, 
we might once again possibly sell some assets. In this case, not Spain, it would be mainly in the Caribbean. Destinations that we consider are too ripe, too mature. And Melia there has a minority participation with a management, a long-term management contract. Long-term means not less than 20 years. Okay, thank you very much. With no more questions, we thank you all for being here, for being interested in our company. It's a pity we cannot give you the traditional glass of wine and champagne because of COVID measures. Thank you anyway. Thank you. Goodbye.